The Honourable Jerry Brownlee, immediate former Vice-Chancellor Emeritus Professor Pat Walsh and his wife Karen, members of the diplomatic community, distinguished guests, university colleagues, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, and welcome to the inaugural lecture of Professor Ilan Noy. I'm Fraser Allen, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Engagement of Victoria University, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Professor Ilan Noy has a rather intriguing title of Chair in the Economics of Disaster. Disasters. He's the university's first chair in this realm, and we understand that this is the first such chair in the world. Professor Noy's role and expertise is a reflection of the calibre of staff we have here at Victoria University. Our staff are just one of the reasons we are proud to be New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and one of the great global civic universities. We are, as Professor Noy's inaugural lecture will demonstrate, amongst the country's leading thinkers and decision makers that help forge the future direction of major economic and societal issues. Professor's no Professor Noy's lecture also exemplifies Victoria's commitment to being a valuable member of the global community and a contributor to international scholarship and discussion. His lecture tonight offers unique insight into the Canterbury earthquakes in their aftermath, but he does not look at the, the issues through a single lens. Dr Noy extends his research beyond the immediate locality, digging deeper into the issues in the historic and international context. Professor Noy came to Victoria in 2012 as Associate Professor of Economics. The following year, he became the Earthquake Commission Ministry for Primary Industries Chair in the Economics of Disasters. He is also the course coordinator for a special topic undergraduate paper in disasters and economic policy. Professor Noy was educated at Hebrew University in Jerusalem before undertaking his PhD at the University of California in Santa Cruz. For the next decade, he caught in the taught in the University of Hawaii's economics department and supervised many postgraduate students. During this time, he was a visiting fellow at the East-West Centre in Honolulu, which promotes relationships between the United States, Asia and the Pacific. Later, he was made fellow at UHERO, an ind independent economic research organisation at the University of Hawaii. Throughout his career, Professor Noy has established himself not only as an expert in the economics of natural disasters, but also as a specialist in international finance and development and environmental issues. He has participated in a long list of conferences, workshops and lectures, which has taken him all over the world, from the UN World Conference in Japan to the American Economic Association Annual Meeting in New Orleans, to the Association of Insurance Companies in Peru. Professor Noy is widely published, with nearly 70 journal articles, book chapters and other commentaries across a diverse range of interests. Topics include East Asia banking crises in the wake of liberalisation, investing in post-disaster recovery, and what happens to foreign aid in the aftermath of large natural disasters. He also sits on the editorial boards of the Journal of International Commerce, Economics and Policy, and the Journal of International Money and Finance. Tonight, Professor Noy draws on his expertise in international research to reveal 10 observations about resilience, recovery, insurance and equity in the wake of devastating earthquakes. And while he takes a world view, there is special emphasis on a devastating event much closer to home, the Canterbury earthquakes of barely four years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Ilan Noy. So my, my talk today is about, um, basically I would like to introduce 10 concepts 
from economics, um, and then attach them to turn observations about, um, about earthquakes. That's the plan for um, this evening. But before that, I want to thank um, uh, Fraser and Bob. Um, I want to thank um, um, my students who are here. Um, I have seven PhD students and two master's students who are mostly here, I think. And a lot of this work has, is work that I've, I've been doing uh, with them. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank, of course, you, all of you, um, for coming here tonight. It's a beautiful day outside. Um, and I, as uh, Fraser mentioned, I came from Hawaii, so I know how to appreciate nice weather. So I really appreciate the fact that you have uh, decided to uh, spend this very nice weather uh, here with me. Um, I, I also want to apologize um, in advance um, for um, raising some issues that you may disagree with. Um, I think that my role as, a, as an academic in general is to raise, um, to describe what I see um, in society and, and, and to, uh, to speci specifically point out things that I think can be corrected and things that may be working wrong. I don't see myself, uh, my role, as, as somebody who needs to, um, to um, be a cheerleader for what is right. And I think there are many, many things that are very right in the way we deal with disasters and in the way we deal. We dealt, for example, with the um, um, Christchurch earthquake. But these are not the things I would like to focus on um, today. Not because I don't think I, I appreciate them, but because I think that's not um, my role. Um, Disasters, I think the first observation I want to start with is disasters are not natural events. They are social events. And you are, of course, familiar with the, with the expression that earthquakes don't kill anybody. It's the buildings that fall on their, their heads that do. Um, and, and as such, I think disasters are very much a topic that should be looked at by social scientists. And that has long been the case, uh, probably about a century ago when sociology started to look at disasters. Um, economics is, uh, economists are a bit new to this game. Uh, so we've been, been looking at disasters only in the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, what I think econ uh, economists bring to this, to this um, issue uh, are two things. The first one, we bring a focus on specific things. Um, so we're more interested in our discipline in things like income, income inequality, employment, um, things like that. And there are a lot of other things that are very important. Right? So our psychological impact of disasters is extremely important. But it's not, um, it's not my, um, my field of, um, of spe specialization or my comparative advantage. So I'm not going to talk about these things. I, um, I will focus on specific things that I think economists should be focusing on. The other thing we, uh, we do is we bring to the table a set of tools. Um, these set of tools and, and, and terms and ideas and, and models um, are unique to, to, to my discipline. Um, in, in, I intentionally chose this picture because it is a very much a Stone Age tools with very sophisticated handles. So we have you know, complicated math and we have fancy statistics. But ultimately, these are still rough tools. Um, and they, they only go, get, get um, you so far. Uh, but I, th I still think that these concepts and the concept I'm going to talk about today are potentially very useful in understanding many aspects of um, disasters. Um, I am Jewish, but um, I'm not trying to be Moses. Um, I'm the, I chose 10 commandments, uh, I, ten, 10 observations, not because I think they are commandments. Um, I'm, I'm, I just chose 10 things that are sort of random things that I, I have observed and I think are worth mentioning here in this um, in this forum, they are by far not the most, the ten most important things that have to do with it, with the economics of um, um, disasters. Okay, now I've managed to have Moses and the Dalai Lama on the on the slide from uh, on the, on the screen. I think from now on it's downhill, but um, I want to start. The first concept I want to talk about is the uh, the invisible hand. You are, I think, familiar with this concept. Uh, comes from Adam Smith. Um, and you probably may be familiar with the, probably the most famous quote in economics, uh, this quote from Adam Smith's um, The Wealth of Nations. And his idea is that not, not from the benevolence of the uh, butcher or the uh, brewer or the baker, we, we get our, uh, our dinner or, for that matter, our beer, um, but rather because of their self-interest. So 
the model that co most economists, the way they think about the economy is, is a set of individuals who are pursuing their own self-interest and that self-interest um, um, eventually, um, or not eventually, leads to, to um, efficient and successful outcomes. And that was the insight that, one of the insights that came from, from Adam Smith, who by the way did a lot of research on disasters as well. Um, uh, but then we sort of forgot about that later on. Um, the way I think um, this model of, of the invisible hand applies to this concept of, of, of disasters is, if you look at the, um, um, the way urban planners think about the city, uh, the way urban planners think about the city, they have basically, I think, two models. Um, one is, is the model of a, of a um, machine. Uh, and, and if you think of the city as a machine, then you as an, an engineer, as the policymaker, can sort of tweak it and can screw some things and unscrew some other things and make the machine um, work better. Um, the alternative is to think about the city uh, as a living colony of organisms. Um, and as a, if, if it is a living colony of organisms, your ability to have an impact on that, um, uh, on the city, is much more limited. Of course, we do have some impact. You know, even somebody who grows a bonsai tree has some impact on the way that the tree grows. Um, but but uh, our ability to have an impact on the, on, on the um, development of a city is much more uh, limited. And for economists, that, that concept of, of a, living organ, a living colony of organisms, I think, is much more in line with the way we see economies. Um, and this is important when you have a big disaster, you have a big shock, the way you then think about how to, um, to recover will, to a large extent, be dictated uh, by, by your concept of a city, whether you, you think you can actually engineer every little part of that process or whether you, you're just uh, trying to um, provide guidelines and, and, and incentives. The second concept I want to talk about um, is convergence to an equilibrium. So our models, in, in our basic model, we have a supply and demand and the, the, the price adjusts so that supply is equal to demand and, and markets clear. Um, and if we ha suddenly have a shock, um, then eventually the, that market will, will converge back to its equilibrium. Okay? It may take time, and, and of course there's a lot of interest in describing how that process happens, but eventually we converge back to, to an equilibrium. Why is this important? Um, this is the uh, uh, map of the uh, city of Kobe. Kobe had an earthquake in 1995, so 20 years ago, a bit more than 20 years ago. Um, if you look at the map here, can you see this little <coughs> tiny dot? Yeah. Um, so this, this is the, the center of the city of Kobe. These are actually two um, reclaimed islands. Um, this was the area that was impacted most heavily by the, um, by the event in, in 1995. So what the map describes here is um, the uh, taxable income, essentially GDP of, GDP of the city. Okay. And what you observe is that in 1995, there's large declines in, in incomes. Not very surprising. This is immediately after the, uh, the earthquake. Um, but what I think is more interesting and, and potentially more troubling is that the economy seemed to have revived or recovered uh, by 2000. But then if you look at 2010, so 15 years after the, um, after the earthquake, you see that incomes have declined back again. Okay, now just to clarify the map, I'm colorblind, but, but still I'm told that there are blue colors there. The bluer it is, um, the, 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 high, um, the stronger the, um, the decline. Um, so what we observe here is that relative to what would have happened in Kobe had this earthquake not occurred, incomes, incomes are lower by about 10%. So 15 years after the earthquake, incomes are lower by 10% as a direct result of the earthquake. Okay. How we calculate that is a long story and it's a completely different lecture, but that, that's basically the finding from, from this paper. Um, so what, what this suggests is that in some cases the economy doesn't, doesn't converge back to its equilibrium. It converges back to a different equilibrium, in the case of Kobe, to a worse equilibrium. And this is not a unique case. New Orleans is never going to recover its population. So the, the, the uh, population of New Orleans is going to stay about 20% lower than, it, what, than it, what it was the day before um, the city was flooded in 2005. And we can, we can um, identify a lot of other examples like that. 
Another concept that um, is important in economics is no free lunch. It's not entirely accurate today because I, I'm told there is some food outside. Um, but, um, but still, the idea in economics is basically there's always, there's always a trade-off, right? In any kind of decision, there is a, uh, there's some benefits and some costs, there is a trade-off. Uh, the trade-off I want to focus on today um, is the, the, the trade-off between speed and built back better. I think most of you are aware of that, of that trade-off. So when we, we have a big shock, like we had in Christchurch, um, policymakers uh, need to decide whether they want to pursue an, a, a strategy of speed, recover, reconstruct as quickly as possible, but then at the cost of rebuilding vulnerabilities and, and, uh, that were exposed by the event, or alternatively, um, you want to build back better. Now, the choice in Christchurch was clearly build back better. This is a choice that came both from the bottom, from, from community uh, consultations and so on, and from the top um, as well. What we need to understand, though, and this is the reason I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out to this, this trade-off, is not the fact that the trade-off exists. I think this is obvious. But the fact is that if we choose Build Back Better, we need to acknowledge the fact that th that will be at the cost, at the cost of slower um, recovery. And we need to do, and this is wh where, where it's important, I think, um, to do anything possible to speed that up as much as we can within the constraint of our strategy of building back better. OK? Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll go get back to this um, later on. Number four, property rights. Um, property rights for economists are not a human right. They're not something sacred. Um, property rights are, uh, in, in, in my view at least, and in most economists' view, Property rights are a way to allocate, um, when property rights are allocated uh, clearly and, and when property rights are well defined, then outcomes are better. Then people will invest, then people will uh, be able to borrow in order to invest, and the incentives for people, for, for, um, for all the actors in the economy, firms, people, and so on, households, uh, the, the incentives are such that the uh, outcome, outcome will be uh, better. This is a picture of the uh, city of Concepcion um, in Chile. Um, Concepcion had an earthquake in um, February 27, 2010, so five and a half years ago. Um, and uh, about three years after the uh, earthquake, um, the government announced that they are done with reconstruction. They've finished reconstructing everything. The, the level of destruction was similar to Christchurch, maybe even in, by, some, by some measures even um, uh, bigger, depending on how you measure it. Um, but uh, the government announced three years after the fact that they've done with reconstruction. This was a bit premature. Uh, but by now, five years after the earthquake, they're done. They're clearly done. And I was there just two months ago. I took this picture two months ago. Um, they're clearly done with, with reconstruction. But they chose to go for speed. Okay, There's no question about that. If you look at um, this community here, this community was destroyed by the tsunami that came up um, from the bay here. So this is the bay. The tsunami wave came up here and destroyed this community. The government decided to rebuild that community exactly where it was. It's surrounded on three sides by water. Okay? And there is no clear evacuation route from there. Uh, and the, the government basically decided and paid to, for people to rebuild exactly in that location. Okay. Um, why? Because it was too complicated to deal with the property rights issues. Okay. It's much easier um, to just give the money, build back, and that's it. Okay. We clearly in Christchurch chose something different, right? And we chose, I think, in, in two different instances to reallocate property rights. One is the, obviously the red zoning. Um, and, and the other is the, uh, the minimum requirement within the CBD, the, the uh, minimum requirements on development of, of um, the, area, the plot area that could be developed. So the decision in Christchurch was, uh, even though a lot of the plots in the CBD were very small plots, owners will not be allowed to develop them unless they can develop a bigger, um, a bigger development. So they will not get consents for smaller um, um, uh, buildings. Okay. So what that, that meant in Christchurch in the CBD, that people no longer had clear title to their land. They still had title to their land, but they weren't, allow they weren't allowed to develop it. Okay. And the approach that the, that the um, uh, government took 
um, and I think to, to, to a large extent is uh, supported by the community, was that the, we will let people sort this out. So the, the owners of these small plots of land will get together and somehow um, reallocate property rights um, so that they could uh, redevelop the land. That didn't quite well uh, work that smoothly as we expected, right? And that, I think, was one of the reasons uh, that we see a delay, uh, we see a slow recovery in, in um, Christchurch. And the point is, we know that property rights, clear, clear and well-defined property rights, facilitate um, economic activity. So we need to caref always carefully think that we always allocate property rights um, uh, clearly. Another, um, uh, I think, important insight in economics, well, you can judge if it's important or not, um, is, is the idea of externalities. Externalities are situations in which the, the, there are two parties to a transaction. There's always two parties to a transaction. That transaction has an impact on a third party. And that third party um, is impacted by the transaction, but is not part of the decision-making process. And the two parties to the transaction don't consider the, the third party interests when they decide on the, uh, on the transaction. The example I want to uh, use here is the courts. Um, normally, when we have a court case, the only people who are affected by the court case are the parties to the, to, to, to the transaction, to the litigation, okay? the litigants. Um, in post-disaster environments, we have a situation in which every court case has an impact on many, many, many other people. This was, for example, very true with, with insurance in Christchurch. Um, with insurance in Christchurch, there were a lot of litigation for various issues that had to do with insurance, for example, whether excess applies for every single event or not, and, and things like that. Uh, but what's unique about the post-disaster environment that any kind of decision by the courts has an impact on others and potentially on thousands of other people. Okay, and cause, because a lot of people were in the same situation and they were all waiting for the courts to decide on that specific legal question. Okay, so in this case, the, the cost of a delay, the cost of a, a slow decision-making process in, in the courts is, is, is very high. Okay, so we have an extra incentive to speed up this process. Okay, we didn't put any mechanisms in place to speed up legal decisions with, in, in the post-disaster um, situation in, in Christchurch, even though the externalities were, were very severe. Okay? So, you know, maybe one possibility is do special earthquake courts. I don't know if the term earthquake courts sort of rhymes, but, um, but still um, do something like that where decisions have to be undertaken by law and have the, the, the legal mechanisms for it and have the, the resources for it. All decisions have to be undertaken in 90 days. Um, and then we won't have all these delays that are created by everybody waiting for the courts to decide on specific uh, legal issue. Another uh, important distinction is the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Um, when we talk about situation in which there are various scenarios, in economics we define risk as situations in which there are different scenarios and we know what the probabilities for these scenarios are. Uncertainty is when we don't know what the probabilities are, and some, in some cases, we don't know what the scenarios are. I think in many instances in, um, that have to do with, with, with disasters and our policy making uh, in disasters, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we pre pretend that that uncertainty is risk. Okay? We're in situations in which we don't really understand the probabilities, uh, but uh, for example, our, 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 you know, my friends, the geologists, produce probabilities about earthquakes, but typically the way they produce these probabilities about earthquakes, there's a very large confidence interval around them. But when we need set, uh, to set policy, we cannot really handle confidence intervals, so we use the, the point estimates. We use the actual probabilities as if they are precisely estimated probabilities of, of risk. Just to give you an example, I wanted to talk about early warning systems, but maybe that would take me too long. Um, uh, the, our earthquake-prone building policy, okay? We divide the country into three zones. Um, red, well, I think it's red. I'm colorblind. Um, red, green, and yellow. Um, um, you know, high risk, medium risk, and low risk. Uh, and we, we have very different policy uh, set in law for these three, uh, three areas. If you look at the, uh, the, the, map, the, the map that we divided New Zealand in 2005 and the map that we have in 2015, there's only one difference between those two maps. 
Christchurch was yellow and now it's red. Okay, so why did we change Christchurch from yellow and red between 2005 and 2015? I think you know the answer to that one. Um, because there was an event. So what we are essentially doing here is we are fighting the last war, the war that already happened. We are basing our, um, our um, policy on, on a map that is very uncertain. Conflict of interest alert. The next few slides are on insurance. I'm partly funded by the Earthquake Commission. Um, none of what I'm saying here is the view of the Earthquake Commission. Um, and actually, what they think is not what I think. And what, anyway, you get the, you get the point. Um, but um, the, first, the first thing I want to talk about is, is transferring risk. So um, we have many ways to transfer risk, and spe specifically financial risk. Um, uh, one of them, one probably the most well-known one, is insurance, although there are other ways to transfer um, um, risk. This is the, um, um, the speed of claim resolution in, in Christchurch. Um, so what you observe here is um, that about, this is the graph only goes up to um, um, a year and a half ago. So a year and a half ago, about 75% of claims in Christchurch have been resolved. Okay? The number today is around 90%. And it changes across uh, different um, uh, private uh, insurers. Uh, EQC has a higher number. Um, okay. Is this me? Uh, I, I just re realized that we didn't tell you where the emergency exits are, by the way, which is a bit odd for the, given the topic of this event. So there are exits over there and over there. Um, okay, um, so about 90% of claims have been resolved five years after the earthquake. Okay? This is unusually um, slow. Okay? I don't think there are many examples of other events in which um, um, that has been taken so long. Of course, we also have much more insurance coverage than any disaster in the history of the universe, I think. Okay? Uh, it's important to note, and, and we have managed to transfer a lot of the risk, even more importantly, we have managed to transfer a lot of the financial risk uh, because of, uh, or the financial damages because of Christchurch offshore to the Europeans, to the Americans, maybe even to the Japanese as well, um, which was a great success, right? So they, they ended up paying a lot of our um, uh, damage. Um, but it has also taken a long time to re, uh, resolve um, um, claims. We, I have some uh, research with colleagues from um, uh, resilient organizations in Christchurch, um, which we have looked at uh, the way firms uh, recovered from the, uh, from the disaster. And what we find there is that um, insure, um, firms, for, all, for firms that had viable business after the earthquake, so some firms had no viable business and had no chance of recovery. For firms that had a vi viable business, those firms that had insurance and were paid their claims, and their claims were paid almost in full, um, recovered the best. Okay? The firms that had claims, had insurance, and had claims, and their, their claim resolution has been delayed, recovered the worst. They recovered worse than firms that had no insurance. Okay? So um, what you observe here on the other, on the one hand, insurance is great because those, those, those firms that had um, claim, uh, were paid their claims were very successful, but clearly there was some, 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 some um, difficulties um, as well. This is, by the way, so this, this graph is, is both for residential and for corporate and, and commercial. Um, so, so we see this problem, uh, I think, everywhere throughout the, um, the insurance market in, in um, New Zealand. This is not to say that insurance is not great. Again, we transferred so much of the risk um, to the Japanese and the Americans and, and everybody else, uh, but at some cost. So it's, it's a bit like a balloon. You press it in one, one place and sort of some, some risk pops um, somewhere else. In this case, the, the risk that popped out was the delay. Um, moral hazard. I think the example I have here is the best example for moral hazard that I could find. If you provide people with um, speeding tickets, uh, speeding ticket insurance, they have no reason not to speed, right? Um, and that's the idea of moral hazard in economics. Moral hazard has nothing to do with morality. 
uh, we in economics tend to, take, to pick terms that will confuse other people. Um, and, and we clearly have done very well with this one. Um, so it, it's the idea that um, if you have an insurance contract for a risk, that changes the incentives for people to, pre to try and prevent that risk or mitigate that risk. Okay, that's the idea of moral hazard. Um, I think that to a large extent, moral hazard um, is not a big issue with disaster insurance. Um, just to, you know, from my own personal experience, um, the reason I don't always um, put a new battery when my fire alarm battery runs out uh, is not because I know I have fire insurance and I do have fire insurance. Um, it's, you know, maybe I'm lazy, maybe I don't have a ladder, um, but it's not because I have um, fire insurance. And I think for most of us, the reason some of the buildings in town here on the slopes are not tied to their foundations is not because people have EQC, uh, EQ cover, right? It's because they are, well, I don't know why, but, but they don't. They don't tie, some, some, some people don't tie their houses to their foundations um, well enough. On the other hand, while I don't think moral hazard is a big concern, uh, the flip side, um, the, the flip side of that is to create through the, the insurance uh, through the insurance contracts, create in, create incentives for people to do more prevention. Okay, so for example, I come from Israel. In Israel, if you want to have car insurance, you have to put a, a, an alarm in your car. You cannot take car insurance if you don't uh, have an alarm. And car insurance is mandatory, which means everybody has alarms in their cars. Um, so we can use the insurance uh, contracts to, to create the incentives for people to do more prevention. And we don't use that adequately in this country at this point in time. This is an underused tool that we have, and it's actually quite easy to do. Okay? You worry about chimneys falling down, then put in, you know, put in the insurance contracts a condition that you know, chimneys, if you don't put your something, you know, then take your chimney down or whatever it is, then there, there is going to be either you cannot insure or, or you, you'll get a, a, you know, a, a higher cost on your premiums or whatever it is, or get discounts on your premium if you do some, some other prevention uh, mechanism. Okay? Contracts are important in, in economics. Um, contracts guide the, the way we transact. In this case, I'm thinking about insurance contracts, and I think I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the three words, as, when, new which probably will become the motto for Christchurch from now till eternity, these three words. These three words that are both in the um, um, EQC Act and they are also in, in most of the private insurance contracts um, in Christchurch, including in most of the commercial insurance contracts. Um, these words, these three words define what, what is the, uh, the obligation of the insurer to return to the, uh, the property to as when you condition. Okay. Now, what that led, led, uh, led in Christchurch, in terms of commercial buildings, um, in many cases, that led people to choose to demolish their building instead of to repair it. Okay. Um, because they could get an as-when-new building instead of being stuck with their old building that they had, the repaired old building that they had uh, before. So we ended up in Christchurch in a lot. Did I lose you? Um, uh, we ended up in Christchurch with a lot more demolitions than we should have had. Okay, um, and you know I was driving through Concepcion two months ago, as I told you, uh, and people showed me, oh, this building was dis uh, damaged and was repaired. This building was repaired. This building was repaired. This building was repaired. Try and do that in in you know the CBD in Christchurch. This building is demolished. This building will be demolished. This building was demolished, and now somebody's constructing something else there. Um, now this is clearly suboptimal from, it is optimal from, the, peop, from the, the owner's perspective and that's why they chose it. But there are externalities involved, going back to that idea of externalities. Um, if you are an owner of a building and your decision to demolish the building will mean that there will be a delay in recovery of that building, that means that the coffee shop ex across the street has less business for the next two or three years or whatever it is that, that, that delay that demolition um, entails, and all the other businesses around you. And when every single business no, uh, building owner faces the same dilemma, and there are all these externalities involved, we end up with a, with, a, with a lot less optimal policy and a lot more demolitions. We need to think how not to do that next time. Okay, and that means redesigning the insurance um, contracts. Um, another um, important um, concept, which I 
skip these risk tranches. Um, here I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about public insurance. So typically we think of public insurance, public insurance for anything, is covering the most extreme um, um, uh, risk. Okay. Typically we think that private sector insurance can handle lower um, risk, so um, higher probability but lower scale risk. Um, and typically the private insurers are unwilling to insure the most extreme risks, and that's why we need a public sector um, in the mix. Uh, and that's, for example, the way we do the public health system here. Okay? If you, you have a flu and you need to go to the doctor, you go to the, your GP and you pay for it. On the other hand, if you have, you know, God forbid, you need open heart surgery, um, then, then you go, you know, the, the public system takes care of you. For whatever reason, we decided to flip that with, with uh, earthquake insurance. So our public system takes care of the first $100,000 of damages, and then the private sector kicks in. Okay? And why are we doing it this way? This is, these are basically historical reasons that have to do with the way the insurance evolved over a year and the fact that we haven't changed the Insurance Act in 22 years. Okay? Um, I, I see no reason why, since theory um, um, tells us that the rational way to organize an insurance system is when the public se sector takes the, uh, the upper tranche, what, what Treasury calls the second loss, Okay, and the, public, uh, the private sector takes this first loss, I see no a priori why we shouldn't have the same arrangement with earthquake insurance. Okay? And flip what we have today um, uh, in, into um, um, an earthquake commission that takes care of the second loss. That will resolve a lot of other issues because you know, a lot of the issues that had to do with scaling up of operation of the earthquake commission, for example, when it had, I don't know, about 20 people before, the, uh, before crisis and now has almost 2,000 people. Um, that scaling up, that was very difficult and will be difficult if, if that happens again, you know, 20 years from now, that will be eliminated if we flip it, okay? If the Earthquake Commission takes care of the second loss um, and the first loss is, is handled by the, um, by the private sector, the same way that we do health. Um, economists don't, gili don't believe in, free competi in, in sort of a f completely free competition, okay? Uh, free competition is Somalia, um, and, and I think we all can all agree that Somalia is not a very, function, very well functioning um, economy. We need, we believe in competition within when there are established rules of the game. And what I'm thinking of here is is um, is insurance. We don't we don't uh, we don't have an insurance regulator in this country. Okay, we do have the the Reserve Bank that is uh, in charge of uh, Prudential. Uh, regulation, but we don't have an, an insurance um, regulator. So I try to, to find other places uh, that don't, ha doesn't, don't have an insurance regulator. So I went to the most extreme case I could think of, and that was Texas. Um, Texas does have an insurance regulator. It's not only that they have an insurance regulator, the insurance regulator sets the premiums for residential um, um, uh, insurance. Okay? And sort of their, their, their uh, mandate is to sort of a Goldilocks mandate to make sure that the premiums is not too low and not too high. Okay? Seems like a bit of a task, but, um, and I'm not advocating that you know, an insurance regulator um, needs to um, regulate uh, premium prices. But um, I think a regulator that, for example, limits the number of contracts, the types of contracts that are available. Here, not only every, every insurance company sold different kind of insurance um, uh, covers for residential housing, many of them sold multiple versions of insurance um, to, to, um, to households. So when, when you know, the, the big earthquake hit, you had to figure out which insurance contract applies where and what are the differences, and you had to, you know, it's a big tangle. Um, in, most, in most places, there is an insurance regulator that sets the types of contracts that can be offered and limits the, the variety of contracts that can be offered. Okay? And this is a win-win situation. This is not a zero-sum game where the insurance sector will lose because we, we, uh, we, we um, institute a regulator. The insurance sector will use because typically sectors um, actually operate better when they are operating, again, when it's not Somalia. Um, but uh, and, and, the, and, and the customers, the consumers will, will, will gain because you know, we won't have the, the observed delays that we have in, in insurance um, resolution.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, kia ora tātou. Tolo falafa. My name is um, Bob Buckle. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of the Victoria Business School. Um, and Ilan is um, obviously one of my colleagues. Um, so um, this evening, uh, the, the purpose of an inaugural lecture is to um, give you some insight into the areas in which our professors are professing. And, uh, and also, in doing so, um, uh, we encourage them to put some ideas out there, provoke discussion, debate, and further thinking. And I think this evening, Ilan has done that uh, extremely well. We're going to break with um, usual practice with our this evening's inaugural lecture. Uh, Elan said he is very happy to uh, encourage questions from the floor. So my initial task is to um, f invite questions and field those. I'm advised that um, uh, the lecture has been recorded and it will be made available publicly. And uh, we are proposing to do the same with questions, so uh, I just thought you should know that. So um, <clears throat> I encourage uh, questions. Uh, I um, try to keep them succinct and will encourage Elan to be succinct in his response. So you're very welcome to um, uh, pose some questions. Have you got your microphone working now? You should come out here. And, yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm and, working, and, but there's a, and, mic and, there's a uh, roving mic. So here, here we have John. a question from the floor. Could you introduce who you are and then put your question? John McClure, um, Professor of Psychology here at Vic, also stuff on earthquakes that I do. Um, Elin, thank you for your talk. Um, in terms of EQC policies, they cover both the building and um, contents. And I wonder if they don't take your wise advice on one issue, would it be simplest just to, to require people to have contents privately insured for a disaster as well? Because they spend a lot of time, the assessors, assessing whether this TV was cracked in this earthquake or whatever. Would that also streamline the process? So the Treasury has a document um, suggesting uh, outlines of review for the Earthquake, uh, the Earthqu earthquake Commission Act. Um, and, and part of that is to drop contents coverage. Uh, and also to drop most of land coverage, although some parts of land, land coverage um, will remain. And that will clearly um, significantly reduce the amount. So Earthquake Commission had to deal with about, I think, 500,000 claims, plus or minus, you know, since we I talked about confidence intervals, plus or minus 100,000. Um, uh, and, um, um, but, and, and, and some significant part of that was content uh, insurance, clearly something that delayed the, the, the progress for the Earthquake Commission. That seems to be a, a low-hanging fruit in terms of facilitating a, a system in which um, re, um, recover, um, insurance claim settlement will be faster. But that means that the private insurance sector will have more claims to deal with. Um, and since, you know, if you remember the uh, graph I had there, the private sector didn't deal any better with, with um, uh, claim resolution speed than the private than, than the EQC, right? So if, because it had commercial claims there, EQC has nothing to do with commercial claims, and the speed of, of settlement there was was um, 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 uh, equally um, well, slow. Um, so um, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that this will completely resolve um, that aspect of the question. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> There's a question at the back, uh, Dieter. Hey, Professor, ooh, Professor Noy, thank you for your lecture. Wait, wait, oh, wait, sorry, wait. further away. Oh, just, uh, okay. There, yeah. So uh, I'll take the question at the back. Could you just introduce yourself? And Absolutely. Uh, my name is Sam Ripley. I'm with Wellington Regional Emergency, Emergency Management Office. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I was curious, um, on the subject of externalities, I think that's an important one, I'm thinking about large building owners that have a lot of tenants that provide a lot of um, important anchors to the economy. The possibility of, if you mentioned like, you would be required to perhaps remove a chimney to get an earthquake contract. What about um, having agreements with tenants that have no ownership and have no, uh, that don't pay out the contract, but have a vested interest in the results? I think this gets gets into a, a, a bigger issue, is and, and that is that we insure owners, 
um, and we don't insure tenants. Um, and there are um, distributive issues that have to do with that, um, with our decision to insure only owners and not, not, not tenants um, at all. Um, and, and, but that, I think, is a, is a different question. I'm not sure I really understood your question about um, externalities. Um, what, what, what is the externality that you've identified? Maybe if you could clarify that? Uh, with, uh, with a mic, building. with a mic. Sorry. If a, building, if a building owner closes, then their tenants have to seek a new building or whatever. And as you said, with many of them, it took longer to get their claims. Uh, ultimately, those businesses that would be their tenants can't really wait on that or are damaged by waiting on that. So my question was more on if it's uh, a possibility to avoid like the moral hazard issue, if you're going to have, yeah, if you want it to get earthquake coverage, you need to do some mitigation kinds of things. Um, it's a little more unclear about how tenants support that, um, that building owner's value and having that building owner, but I was curious if you'd seen anything where people are thinking of uh, contractual obligations that go outside of uh, the, just the owner, owner's responsibility. Yeah, um, I, I, this is something I would need to think about. I don't know how to structure um, differently the, um, so clearly you need to structure differently the insurance contracts that, so that the owners have different incentives. But exactly how they, they also take into account the, um, the, the, um, the interests of the tenants, which is I think what you're um, referring to, that would be uh, a complicated question that, that is, is very worthwhile thinking about, but I'm not sure that the standard insurance contract that we, we usually work with will, will be suitable for that. We will need another mechanism, probably. Thank you. Uh, at the back, Dieter. Uh, yeah, Dieter Katz. It was on, Dieter. Yep. Dieter Katz. Um, you, um, I'm interested in, um, I wonder whether you could elaborate on what happened in Kobe and whether you think that the, a drop in income can also be expected in Christchurch? Um, so w what happened in, in Kobe is um, a lot of the employers um, left, okay? Um, Kobe had a, a very different economic structure than, than, than Christchurch. Um, and, and, and what a lot of the facilities for these big employers, these are petrochemical um, um, plastics and things like that, industry, heavy industry. Um, um, their facilities were damaged, um, and then they basically used the opportunity of, of the, the fact that their facilities of, uh, were damaged to relocate er elsewhere. The port, which was also a very, very active port, one of the most important ports in the region, um, was, was damaged very severely, was re rebuilt very quickly, but the, the, the business of that port never came back. Um, so because the employers didn't come back, um, people had, the people in, in, in Kobe had to shift from, from industry to services. And services have lower wages associated with them. That's why the incomes um, went down. To go back to your second half of a more problematic part of the question, first of all, I don't have a crystal ball, OK? Um, so I don't know what will happen in Christchurch. Um, I, I do think that we need to think about that question carefully because um, some of the sectors that were mainstays in the economy of Christchurch, um, two sectors that I want to point out are um, tourism and um, tertiary education. Um, those, those two sectors um, are, have not recovered and will probably not recover in the foreseeable future. Okay, so once the, um, the, empl uh, the employment that is now associated with the, the actual rebuild um, um, starts to peter out, and that will happen in, you know, in a few years, I don't know how long, but you know, some estimates are reconstruction will be done in five years, 10 years, 25 years. Um, there, there's a whole range of uh, forecasts about that. Um, but, but once those employers move out of town because the reconstruction is, is, is over, um, what will be the employment engines of, of the city, given the fact that the tourism and tertiary education may not return that quickly? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for that. And I think that that's, that's one thing that um, 
uh, government, local government, central government needs to think about uh, now rather than you know, five, ten years from now. Um, um, yes, a question here. Um, just one moment. Uh, Jared Quinn, I was running the Economic Development Agency in Christchurch during the recovery periods. So maybe just some observations, really. Um, one of the things is the industry structure does make a huge difference. So agricultural hinterland survived. One of the difficulties was the ports and the railway lines. Um, but the dislocations are really important. So when you had central city businesses, they moved to suburbs and their lease costs went up hugely and their leases if you wanted to get one because of scarcity, you're signing six to eight year leases, which affects your ability to make decisions as you recover. Um, and in a simple term, um, you can rebuild the city centre with really strong, uh, great new buildings, which puts a per square metre rental up to 400 or $450 a square metre. But all the people that are in those buildings want to be able to walk out and get their shoes healed or or get services which used to be able to afford to be in the city centre to support these people, but they can't, the, your lower level services can't afford the rentals and the new rebuild. So there's a lot of dislocations in the way that people lose their customer sets as well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and a question in, in the middle here. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I, I can, I know there wasn't a clear question there, but maybe I can say something. Um, Yes, that, that, to me, that's a concern that, that you will not get the convergence back to the CBD because of this, the, econo you know, the economic dynamics that you've um, described. And you know, I was on, in Christchurch on Thursday. And, and you clearly see um, some parts of the CBD down towards the retail um, precinct. They're, they're, they're slowly getting back up, and there is a lot of construction there. But all the, all the area um, east of the cathedral, um, Nothing is happening there, okay, and southeast of the cathedral and all. There's a huge area where nothing is happening. Uh, and it's not clear to me where the economic incentives will be for that area to recover because of the, the dynamics that you have, um, uh, you have described. We'll take a final question, I think. Thank you. Yeah, um, Hamish McKenzie. I'm a structural engineer with Homes Consulting. Um, just interested um, about you, your thinking around EQC and that it should be covering the second um, wave of insurance, not, not the lower end. Um, and I wonder sometimes if we set policy and, and design these systems around the very large and catastrophic events, but fail to consider the um, smaller, more moderate events, the Cedar earthquakes, the, the Gisborne earthquakes um, uh, a few years back. Um, and I'm wondering if your research has considered sort of the, the range of events and impacts and whether the EQC system works well for those smaller and moderate scale events um, to avoid the need for um, private insurance to come into those situations. Sure. Um, I, I don't see any problem with the way that currently this, the, the EQ system handles these small scale events, but I don't, also don't see the reason why the private sector cannot handle them. Okay? Um, you know, the private sector handles fire insurance. Why can't they have, handle you know, small scale earthquakes? Um, and if they can handle this, this, these small events, then, then flipping um, the, um, um, the trenches um, would be fine. Um, now, if, if we are worried that the private sector insurance will retreat from, from covering earthquakes, okay, so we, we end up with a situation like California where um, most homeowners don't, don't have earthquake insurance, that's why we can have an insurance regulator that makes sure that that doesn't happen. Okay? Um, we can specify what should be in or shouldn't be in, a, in a, an insurance contract. Um, so at least a priori, I don't see any reason why the private sector cannot handle a sudden earthquake-like event. Um, and if the private sector can handle it, then why do we need the, private, the, the public sector in there? All right. Thank you very much, Elaine. Let me um, just um, make a, a few closing remarks. Um, 
As a um, capital city civic university, we have um, decided to take initiatives to not only ensure that we have highly capable staff across the areas in which we think are important for teaching and um, areas of research, but we've also consulted with uh, our stakeholders uh, in the public sector, private sector, the community sector, about what they think are critical issues for New Zealand. Uh, not a great surprise that uh, understanding uh, the social, but also in this case, the economic consequences of, uh, of geological, uh, biological disasters uh, was one which uh, was deemed to be an important uh, area for New Zealand. Um, and as Elan pointed out in his lecture, disasters are social issues. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank in particular the Earthquake Commission and the Ministry of Primary Industries for their support in working with us, enabling us to actually appoint someone to focus on this area, um, which may, may not have been possible to do without their support. And in that way, we get research, public debate, teaching, starting to focus on an area where the public have told us is important. So that's an initiative, and that's how this position has arisen. Um, on behalf of the, um, uh, the university, uh, and on Fraser's behalf, I'd like to First of all, invite you all to refreshments um, next door. And finally, let's give a, a, a round of applause to Elan and thank him for his lecture. <laughs>